John's going to kick off, and then I'm going to do some audio demos at the end. So, Mr. Raper. Thank you. What do most people do when the ads come on the television? Uh, some make themselves a cup of tea, obviously. Uh, on the other hand, I like to play a little game to try and identify who's doing the voiceover for the commercial. This is also a game that we can play with uh, documentaries. Uh, so I thought we might start with a, just a little game. Uh, I'd like you to try and name who these voiceover artists are. Elsewhere in the world, a camel at a water hole can drink as much as 200 litres during a single visit. Here, the strategy is to take little and often. And with good reason, for filling the stomach with snow could be fatal. I think most of you would recognise that as uh, David Attenborough. Uh, sorry about the uh, sound effects of the camel eating the snow in the background. Uh, let's try one or two others, which I think might be a little bit more difficult, possibly because there's more background noise. Now today is going to broadcasting first. Over the day, if you want your dives and free submersibles, we'll be with volcanic activity on the Atlantic, deep sea sharks on the Caribbean, and here out in the Bay of Monterey, we've been watching deep sea creatures so hardly ever seen before. Okay, anyone like to hazard a guess on that one? <laughs> Peter Snow. Get 50% for that. <laughs> okay, let's go on and try a couple of others. I think you should find this. It's been 19 weeks since Ben and Mary pulled the foundations of this house. And not only is it finished, but they moved in two weeks ago. I think probably everyone would recognise that as Kevin MacLeod did those grand designs. This one you might find a little bit more tricky. Dennis has had to answer many questions about his testimony. How he overcame the practicalities of staging an exchange in Ashes. Why it took him so long to share his story. And why there were factual discrepancies between his recorded accounts. But Dennis's story also highlights a big issue about the remaining witnesses to the Holocaust. Anyone has had a guess on that one? It's a one minute. <laughs> well done. Fifty <laughs> percent. <laughs> no, it's uh, Juliet Stevenson for uh, uh, Truly Madly Deeply and various other performances. Uh, and finally, I think this one most people should find easy. From the small, right up to the big bulky stuff. Next day delivery. It's got an We've cunningly missed out the name that he's advertising there, but uh, that's Timothy Spall, and I think everyone's probably sick of uh, hearing his voice on the TV. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make to you is that uh, we've all got remarkable powers of hearing and recognition if we care to use them. Uh, and I want to encourage you to train and use your hearing more effectively to identify sound system problems. Uh, how can we, how can we train us? How can we uh, improve our hearing as a diagnostic tool? Well, I think the most important thing is to train ourselves to recognise specific sounds and problems. Uh, as sound engineers, we've all met people who say, "I don't know what it is I'm listening to." Uh, we, as sound professionals, really should uh, be able to uh, direct them as to what things are important and what are, aren't important. Uh, so listening is most effective if we can first identify what it is we're listening for. Is it an ele electrical problem we want to listen to, or is it an acoustical problem? Are we trying to identify something missing from our original signal, or something that's been added to the original signal? Our ears is test equipment, just a, a, a rough specification here because this varies obviously very much from person to person but allegedly it's 10 octaves 
although I don't think it is in me anymore. Uh, dynamic range, about 135 dB in most people. And uh, time discrimination between the two ears, sufficient to give us directional information based on phase differences. I think sometimes hearing is overlooked because there's so much, uh, because the advent of so much other useful uh, test equipment such as SMART, WinLF, MLS, TEF, ESRA and others. So I, want to, uh, I think the point I'm trying to make today is we want to use our ears as well as these other devices. Uh, first of all, some caveats. Uh, our hearing is not linear. Uh, there's processing attached, both physiological and neurological. And uh, not, uh, it's not easy to quantify results uh, from hearing. Uh, for instance, um, trying to guess the sound pressure level and the dominant frequencies of background noise uh, I, I, for one, find incredibly difficult to do just by listening alone. So after listening, we, we need uh, other tools to back, to back us up. So identify the problem by hearing, but quantify it by measurement. And then another caveat is that not everybody's hearing is the same. Your client might well be hearing more or less than you do. How can we make best use of our ears? Uh, well, as already mentioned, really, training ourselves to listen to specific problems or effects. Moving around the area which is covered by our loudspeakers is quite important because we are not going to hear the same thing throughout. Uh, one, two people here sitting on the outside might be certainly getting less uh, HF from our loudspeaker than people sitting in the more central uh, seats. So move around the area when you're listening to the sound. Cupping our ears is quite a useful way uh, of giving them greater direction, directionality. So we can listen to what surfaces the sound is coming from. Uh, I have seen an, uh, an acoustician using a microphone and a parabolic reflector to, to identify reflective surfaces. And I think this is you know, not a bad technique. So someone on the stage makes a sound and he points his parabolic reflector around the auditorium and he can identify uh, what locations that strong are giving strong reflections back to the stage. So as I say, cupping our ears gives them greater directionality and is a very useful tool, although it makes us look a bit foolish sometimes. Uh, always protect your hearing and get it checked occasionally. I think as uh, uh, sound professionals, I think we're probably very lax in this respect. Uh, most of us over the age of 40 get our eyesight checked regularly, but do very little about uh, our hearing. Uh, I think we ought to get into the habit of having our hearing checked more regularly. And uh, the next thing I was going to suggest is we use job-specific sound sources to identify the problems that we're, we're, we're looking for. Uh, some su suggested sounds. Well, the first obvious one is silence, or the closest we can get to it given the environment. And then we should be listening to background acoustic noise, often air conditioning systems and the like make quite a lot of background noise and will make a big difference to speech intelligibility and the like. And we're also li listening for uh, noise coming from our own system, uh, such as electrical uh, noise coming through our loudspeaker and the like. We want to identify those things. Obviously, you're not going to necessarily be able to do much about the environmental noise, uh, but certainly uh, it's uh, a good excuse when people say, I can't understand what's being said if the, if the, if the, uh, if the background noise is, is too, too great. Uh, pink noise is really useful, and I apologise to those who've all heard pink noise before, but it is a very useful tool. I'm just going to play a little burst of it. Now, this is uh, really useful when listening to uh, phasing problems. For instance, the overlap between two loudspeaker coverage uh, 
like a point where two loudspeaker coverages overlap, you get quite strange phase effects situation that you can hear quite, uh, quite easily when using pink noise. Also, comb filtering from reflections from uh, other surfaces is often identifiable using pink noise. Also, uh, things such as listening to the general sound pressure level coverage um, is quite something you can do quite usefully with pink noise. Uh, gated pink noise, in other words, just the pink noise which is switched on and off, is also quite useful because... Uh, because if it ends abruptly like that, we can listen to the reverberant tail in the environment we're in. Again, this is not necessarily something that sound system can do anything about, but it's uh, very good if you're checking out a room or something that may be suitable, say, as a lecture theatre or, or the like here in the first place, just to play some gated pink noise. Obviously, all it allows you to do is identify that there's a reverberant, the room's got a reverberant nature. Uh, you would then have to use uh, test equipment, other test equipment, to actually uh, quantify what that reverberation is. Uh, another sound which I think is very useful when um, uh, test checking out a sound system is a low frequency sweep. And it will uh, give you quite a bit of information about how the loudspeaker is performing. Uh, but it would also identify other rattles and buzzes uh, within the room. So we're just going to give that a go and let's just turn up, level up a bit. I think you probably heard one or two little uh, buzzes and rattles going on within the room. Uh, it'd be quite good to do that over and over again and try and identify what's causing those problems. Uh, I generally use a sweep from about 35 hertz up to about 150 hertz. Uh, and quite often you find things such as diffusers in light fittings that give um, uh, quite a lot of, uh, a lot, quite likely to rattle uh, ventilation grills and that sort of thing. Um, it's not always possible to get the client to do something about them, but it's worth making the effort and pointing out to them at least that you've spotted that these problems exist. And if they want a good sound system, then, uh, you know, we should try and do something about, about them. Uh, one or two uh, more useful sounds that it's useful to take have in your toolbox. I mean, they're fairly uh, obvious. Uh, speech. Um, male speech is, 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 is very good for listening to any low frequency boost in your loudspeaker system and for any distortions that might occur. And this particular recording was done in an anechoic chamber. The different speech sounds which have been moulded into sentences such that the consonants and usual compounds occur in the vowel combinations which are met with very frequently in English. For lack of time, it was not possible to get every group included, although as is shown quite clearly in the figure, upwards of 80% are accounted for. I think nothing else need be said in this place on the subject. Anechoic speech, I have to say, is not particularly easy to find. I found one or two examples on the web, but you sort of need to be a bit careful of copyright and things like that. Uh, alternatively, what is a lot more easy to, easier to get hold of uh, would be studio recorded speech, as in audio books and things like that, and we've got a, quite a good example of that, I think. A few hundred yards to the east, close to Lenin's mausoleum and Red Square, Joseph Stalin, the General Secretary of the Bolshevik Party and Bosch, leader of the Soviet Union, was in his office, the little corner, at an angle of the triangular yellow palace. Stalin, now 53, 22 years now his senior and the father of her two children was meeting his favourite secret policeman. 
you can identify quite a lot of things that are wrong with sound systems by listening to speech. Uh, a particular example for, for me the other day, I was listening to a, a sound system that consisted of uh, two main speakers, a left and a right, and then further down the hall, there were two delay speakers. And when playing uh, speech through the system, it was quite noticeable that when you got to the point where the sound was changing over from the uh, the main speakers to the delay speakers, that there was a significant apparent drop in SPL. And as soon as you went into the delay speaker area, that SPL picked up again. Uh, couldn't work out exactly what it was, but quite clearly there was something not quite right about it. And when we had a look in the DSP, it turned out who originally, whoever had originally programmed the DSP, uh, managed to put the decimal point in the wrong place and put in microseconds instead of milliseconds. And as soon as we rectified that, it, there was a noticeable difference in that there was a, like a seamless changeover from the main speakers to the delay speakers. So, uh, you know, just listening to speech can identify a lot of different things. Obviously, female speech is also important because uh, quite often being uh, higher pitch, uh, you can get some sibilance effects and things like that. So I've got a little example of that. On the 2nd August 1940, people were here on the south coast looked out of their windows to find that the previous night had brought a shower of leaflets. The last appeal to reason by Adolf Hitler. Delightedly, householders collected all the leaflets they could find. Some threaded them on roots of string and hung them over the privy door for use as navigation paper by a number were auctioned in aid of the Red Cross. Okay, so another good uh, recording to have in your armory of things to listen to. And then the, the most obvious one of the lot, of course, is musical instruments, which uh, nearly everybody has. Anechoic recordings of musical instruments are particularly good because uh, if you play a recording, say, of an orchestra that's been recorded in a concert hall, you're adding the original reverberation to the reverberation of the room that you're in. So if you can get an anechoic recording, and there's a good CD commonly available that does have some good examples, uh, then it is well worth the thing to have in your toolkit. And I'll just play you a very quick sample of that. I think uh, an important point to make here is that to use recordings that are familiar to yourself, so you've heard them over and over again in different situations, then it will help you to pinpoint uh, what, what's different about the sound system you're listening to on this particular occasion. Uh, musical instruments. Uh, it's worth knowing uh, the frequency response or extent of, of some of them uh, because uh, things like uh, uh, electric bass guitar or double bass, you know, extends down to 41 hertz. Well, there's a lot of systems that don't go down that low. Uh, tuba extends down to 43 hertz and pipe organ obviously can go down about 32 hertz and even 16 hertz depending on the pipe length. I did have a situation uh, about six months ago where a client rang me and said uh, his loudspeaker was uh, malfunctioning, uh, but it only mal malfunctioned when he played tuba music through it. And I thought uh, uh, I thought he was having a bit of a laugh, quite honestly, at first. But when I went and uh, listened to it, he was absolutely correct, and it was because of the low frequency response of the tuba. Uh, it turned out that the loudspeaker had been, um, uh, shall we say? poorly manufactured and the uh, surround hadn't been glued down sufficiently to the chassis and air was escaping out of the side of the uh, cone and making rather an unpleasant noise. But frankly, if he hadn't played uh, you know, a musical instrument through it uh, that had that extended bass response, he would have never discovered that. Uh, bassoons, quite a useful instrument, it extends down 58 hertz. Uh, commonly use guitar, 82 hertz, and cello's got a low frequency of about 65 hertz. Mid frequencies, there's obviously far too many instruments to even 
discuss, but uh, quite clearly it's worth having just some recordings of one or two of them that you're familiar with and using them. In the higher frequencies, uh, so you can see piccolo over 5K, piano extends up to about 4K, pipe organ again up to about 8 kilohertz, so pipe, pipe organ music is something quite useful to have in your repertoire. And uh, just as a little strange thing, uh, CRT televisions, cathode ray tube televisions, uh, have a 16 kilohertz uh, frequency attached to them, which uh, if you ever want to put want a 16 kilohertz frequency, that, you know where to go to get one. Uh, I, I recently attended a, um, uh, a concert of a, a flamenco guitar, and uh, it was... They had a couple of just nice little speakers sat on the front of the stage, probably six-inch drivers or something in them, uh, which is quite good for the small auditorium. But uh, every time he hit, he hit the bottom E string of the flamenco guitar, the system really honked, really took off. Uh, I'm not really quite sure what it was. I, sus I suspect it might have been something to do with the, um, uh, the lower frequency response of the a PAE loudspeakers they were using, but it could have been a room resonance or something like that. But it's always useful to know what the frequency response of these instruments are, because then it helps you to identify uh, where these problems are occurring. Thankfully, on that particular occasion, the sound engineer corrected it in the interval, and uh, everyone was saved from my mutterings in the uh, second half. Uh, dynamic range of musical instruments, um, that's probably quite useful information, uh, but remember that it does rather depend on the recording technique. If people have they've used compression or anything like that in the recording technique, then uh, the, the dynamic range will be reduced. Uh, just finally, some common uh, electrical problems that uh, certainly the older hands amongst us will be all too familiar with, and this is a call to arms for any sound engineer. usually indicating an earth loop. Uh, commonly, earth loops are uh, caused if you've got a current running down the screen of your audio cable. So you've got two different, uh, you've got equipment at two, at two different locations which have different earth potential. You get a very um, uh, large current flowing down the screen between the two and this induces this hum into your audio, which of course we don't want. Uh, typical equipment faults, I mean, they can be many and varied, but this is just one I recorded the other day, which was, I think, a power supply problem in the um, unpleasant. Nobody wants to hear that on their sound system, so really you just need to identify where it's coming from and get after it. If you uh, have a continuous uh, noise, uh, background noise from your loudspeakers, it's usually indicative of a problem with the gain structure of your system. And this is something that uh, most sound engineers would be familiar with, needs careful attention. Get the gain structure right so you've not got too much gain in any one location and you're not amplifying the background noise of the system. And typically it would sound a bit like this. And then finally, there, uh, you can get electro electromagnetic interference, um, things like hum from transformers that are adjacent to your wiring, or sometimes you can actually get interference from audio frequency induction loops that have been uh, installed in the same location. And if you've got unbalanced cables near them and things like that, they too can induce um, problems in your system. Uh, so far, we've only just looked at a few of the common problems. I think there's so much more we can identify with our hearing, and I think uh, I would like to suggest to you that, uh, that, uh, that after today, we all think a bit about how we can improve our ability to diagnose problems by listening to them. So uh, thank you very much, and I'm going to hand over to Peter, Thanks, who's going to expand these, these okay. ideas a bit. Put my PowerPoint on. Uh, yes, that would be brilliant, yeah. thanks. Um, while we're just doing that, let me just play something to you. It's, well, you'll know what it is. 
I'm just in love with a little bit. That's fine. What happened there? Two things. One is two different sounds. One is pink noise, as you heard, and the other is white noise. Um, a lot of people get them confused. The second thing is they're exactly the same level, and yet the white noise will actually sound louder to most people than the pink, depending on how you do it, depending on your hearing. Some people might think it's the other way around. Depends on your hearing, which is what I want to talk about for the next couple of minutes. Right. Ooh, this is going to be fun. What do I hit? That one? Just... Uh, just Oh, right, right. <coughs> Way too technical. OK. Um, our speech range is pretty big, music range. In fact, our whole hearing range is, John said, about 135 dB. But it's totally non-linear. Um, you, it's inferred in that diagram, but it's not particularly well done. That's more like it. If we look at the red curve, I mean, that is typically the response <coughs> of the ear at mid mid sound levels. In fact, the blue curve is exactly what we do. And in fact, you'll find that we have a peak in our hearing at about 4 kilohertz, 2, 4 kilohertz region of 2 or 3, 4 dB. Um, and that's what you need to be aware of. So when you're listening to things, you have to be aware of your hearing at the time. And if we look at equal loudness contours, you'll see at lower sound levels, we need a hell of a lot more bass to actually make it sound equally loud as we do, say, the mid frequencies of the 1 kilohertz area. And it's very easy to fool yourself when you're listening to things. It's not like that. And there's the typical curve. You can see, so we're most sensitive around about here, sort of 2, 4 kilohertz region, and then again at the other level. And we need a heck of a lot of level at the low frequencies to actually get it. And a lot of people think this is when the bass gets going, this is when the room gets going. But just be aware your hearing is totally non-linear. Depending on the level you listen at, you're going to hear different frequency responses. One thing I think that we might just try, um, that was silly, I've set this on the wrong one. We've got a whole load, load of live demos here, which is always fatal. So if they work, brilliant. If they don't, we're stuffed. And I've just set that to the wrong thing, which is really clever of me. Sorry about that. OK. What I'm going to do... i set this to the right thing, is just play through some of the octave sound. So there's 63 hertz, a nice low octave sound. 500, just give you a feel. And that sounds very different to, say, a tone at that frequency. That's 4K, so we've got a nice high frequency. Those sounds are very useful. I often will play, rather than just pink noises, actually play one of those, see what's going on. I mean, immediately with this one, we can see how directional this speaker is. You know, I think you can get the idea that it's reasonably directional. And it's a pretty wide thing, but it's really handy to see what your coverage is using that sort of sound. The other thing is level changes are kind of interesting. I'm just going to play a little sequence. I want you to see if you can hear any changes? It, it's pink noise. I hope we all heard a difference. Otherwise, I think you should look for a different job. Um, <laughs> Any ideas the sort of level differences we were playing about? I mean, let me start again, because I think it's kind of interesting to do. Any idea what that change was? Anyone hazard a guess? How many? Three. Three. You're cheating. Yes, it was 3 dB. It's very good. And then we'll do the next one. So we've gone back to zero. That one? It was pretty obvious, wasn't it? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going to put seven in. I should have got you. All right, never mind. Anyway, but it gives you a feel for the, the, the change. 
And indeed, I've been to lectures where people say 3 dB is a minimum you, you can hear the difference of. Absolute bollocks. Sorry. Um, uh, it's, I mean, you can change things by 1 dB. It's very obvious. Half a dB, even depending on what you're doing. Again, can be very obvious uh, as to what's happening. And in fact, let's play this sequence then. All right, this will get you. Listen to this one. Hear the change? Yeah. 1 dB. So it is there, but it's subtle. But you can, you can certainly hear it. On other things, you hear it even more. OK, and then we'll just go carry on. Any idea that one? Don't say three, because I've done that one. And that was four. So again, it's a very nonlinear process, and it depends on how loud you play this as to where you actually can, can judge it as well. But I mean, you, you can play the game if you like. OK, so that, that's pink noise, which is kind of useful. What we might do is do it with speech, if I get the right button, and see what happens there. So what I'm going to do is I'll play you, the idea is to play you some, oh, it's not, yes, that's the one. Let's try that. This is a test of the public address system. You're going to get really fed up with this piece of speech because it's all the way through, but I'm just warning you now. All right. Signal level and speech intelligibility. Public address system test. This is a test of the public address system. Anybody notice the difference between after the gap? No, 1 dB. OK. Now, I might, I'll do it during the speech, but of course, speech is lots of spaces and gaps, but it gives you an idea. This is a test of the public address system. This is a functional test for system operation, loud speaking. Yeah, that was two. So you, you can kind of start to see. So you get a feel for these numbers are quite small, but we can definitely hear changes. And a 2 dB change in the right situation, you're very audible, and you can actually change the intelligibility quite a lot as well, which we may or may not get onto, depending on the time. OK, so that kind of does some level changes. Let's do it, let's do it with a tone. Let's be interesting. That's about right. Oh, I hope this isn't too loud. Anyone want to guess the frequency? Sorry, that's a really loaded, nasty question, isn't it? It isn't one kilohertz, because that would have been obvious. <laughs> Give the teddy bear to Mr. Billow over there. It was 800 hertz. But let me just change it. I'm going to change it by 1 dB as we go. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's the other way of doing it. It's easier to hear it coming up than going down sometimes as well, depending on what you're doing. But again, a dB is pretty subtle stuff. And yet, can make quite a big difference in an audio assessment, especially in a reverberant space from an intelligibility point of view. It's quite a noticeable difference. OK, so we've done all that stuff. Let's go back and get rid of that. Um, John played you a low frequency sweep. I just want to play you. I often do sweeps as well. And you can, you can concentrate on the low end for, for buzzes and rattles. You can also hear other stuff. I mean, I typically do something like a 12-second sweep. I'll, I'll play it. It's only 12 seconds, so it shouldn't be too bad. Hopefully it's not too loud. Ooh. <laughs> Deliberately interested... In, 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 inserted nasty in the end of it just to get you going. What's interesting is that you missed the whole bottom two octaves coming out. The sweep started off, there was nothing coming out of the speaker that you could hear. Um, and often you can overload things with, with low frequency sound, so it's, it's good to filter them often. I mean, I've seen all sorts of problems. If you just low filtered low, or high pass filtered, it would have actually saved a lot of problems. Um, I'm going to listen to this one. <laughs> Any 
Anyone like to think what the difference on that one was? Again, you need to know the reference. When all these sounds you're playing with, you need to know what it should sound like. And what I did there, in fact, was to, it was a response for speaker. It was actually low pass, it was, there was no low frequencies, and there were no high frequencies. You just got the middle range. So again, playing the suite, knowing what it should sound like is quite useful. Uh, and you get buzzes and rattles on the way, which is all good fun. Let's do the same with noise. It's, you know what pink noise is. I'm not going to insult you with that anymore, so let's do something different. Does that sound like pink noise, or does it sound different? No low end. Exactly, no low. So you mean, you know, put pink noise through and you, you hear something like that, no low end. So it's very useful to know what these things should sound like. And... Mm, all right. There's the missing lows, but all the highs are gone. Um, so again, by knowing what this should sound like and knowing what normal pink noise should sound like, you're in for a thing. And what happens with this one then? No lows, no highs, just a bit in the middle. Okay. So again, if you know what pink noise should sound like, it's, it's, it's a useful thing to know. What I'm now going to do, I'm just going to play you some speech, and I've filtered it so you can hear the, the important bits of speech and why we need various frequencies. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll start off down the low end and see what happens. Turn up a tad. Not very much. So. All right, that's the low frequency component in speech. That's about one, two, five hertz area of the thing, all right? So there's very little intelligibility in there, but you've got the rhythm. But it's very important for naturalness. If we now go, say, to 250, which is what, mid? I've heard sound systems like that. <laughs> like design sound systems. No, I haven't. <laughs> well, I've sorted a few out. But again, you know, it's restricted. We have an idea what we're like. This gives you a better idea of what's happening. Does everybody get what it's being said now? You should buy now. I mean, the others, you won't. You get the rhythm. And then we get up to, say, 1K, just for the sake of argument. OK, and then just do this one for a hell of a bit. <coughs> Apart from Mr Billow, any ideas which band that might have been? Eight. Yeah, it's all that high stuff with the sibilance and everything. Um, but again, it's very important to get the naturalness and the clarity through. So again, by knowing what's missing, by listening to this stuff, you can tell a hell of a lot what a system's doing um, on speech or other sounds. I think that'll do for that. Sorry, my mouse has just decided to go weird. Right, now then, the other thing is distortion I want to talk about. And again, by knowing what things should sound like, it becomes fairly obvious. So if we start off with a, a suite that's... Um, that was a distorted sweep, fairly obviously, but it was done digitally. And I'd actually hit the end stops, and what you get is aliasing, and you can hear all those other sweeps coming in at the end of it due to this aliasing problem, which is a digital thing. You don't get that with an analog system. So again, if you play this, we know we've overloaded the system, and you can hear it initially as well. But it's, it's quite an interesting problem. And if we do... 
This is a test of the public address system. This is a functional test for system operation, loudspeaker coverage, signal level, and speech intelligibility. Public address system test. This is a test of the public address system. This is a functional test for system operation, loudspeaker coverage, signal level, and speech intelligibility. Can I tell that's distorting? Good. Okay, but as, and obviously, you know, I, I just increased the level till we actually started to overload uh, the input stage or the amplifier stage on the thing, and it gets nasty like that. But that is very typical of overloading a system. Um, analog and digital are a bit different the way they do it. And it depends if there's a transformer sitting in the middle or not, because that might saturate in a different way or it might clip in a different way. But again, it gives you an idea what it should sound like. <coughs> This is a public address system test. This is a test of the public address system. This is a functional test for system operation, loudspeaker coverage, signal level, and speech intelligibility. Fairly obviously, some distortion in it, but not as, as much. I mean, I've heard systems that play like that all the time. Um, and you'd say, it's distorting. They go, what? No, it's all right. It's like that. Um, so let's just try this one, just as a final. Public address system test. This is a test of the public address system. Any idea how much that might have been into clipping or overload? That's a really tricky one, I know, but it's only 4 dB into the red. So it's pretty instantaneous when you, when you get a, a problem like that. Right. Um... I think we can finish with those. The other thing I wanted to do was talk a little about, about acoustics, which is my, one of my particular things. Um, and the best thing, really, everybody goes in and goes, oh, that. This room, immediately you can tell it's really dead. I mean, look around it, you can do it. But if you stand here and do it, I don't know if you'll hear this, but... See here, I get a slap off the back, which I'm going off the PA. Also, there's a flutter echo between these two parallel walls going on, which, depending where you stand, you may or may not get. It's pretty, but it's pretty dead. I mean, you can hear that impulse response. It's very fast. So there's no real tail, as we would say, on here. Um, I looked this place up on the web. I mean, there's no RT data for it, but just looking at it, I thought it was going to be fairly dead. So I thought I'd have to import my own sort of rev chamber or whatever. So I'm going to play you a gunshot, which is the other way of doing that, if a bit more macho, and this is a really big space. And I think you'll get the, the hang of what reverberation is all about from this one. Can we turn that up a bit? Sorry, I turned this down, which was very silly. I'll, I'll play it again. Now, John turns it up, I turn it up, and we're going to blast your ears off. <laughs> so in here, the initial thing, and then that's a really nice long decay afterwards. You're hearing the room and the speaker and everything else, but, but that gives you an, I an idea. Um, listen to this one. Listen very carefully to this one. I should play this only once. No, why not? I shall play it again. Did anybody hear anything apart from the decay? There's an absolute slap in there. Yeah, in fact, there's two echoes, actually, at the start of that decay. And they're frequency dependent as well to make it even more interesting. Um, they're mainly 250 hertz, but there's a, a later reflection comes in at 4 kilohertz. So your, your first reflection is about 80 milliseconds, 85 milliseconds, <coughs> and the other one's 245 later on. So you can hear this thing. So again, by doing a, an impulse hand clap, you can hear all these so, so, sort of things and see what's going on, because that's going to come back and hit you later on. And by, as John was saying, you can use directional techniques to find out where it comes from. Uh, if you've got a curved room, just look at the curve, and it, that, that's where it is. I mean, it, it's pretty obvious. Now, what happens with speech and other signals in a, in a reverberant space? And I think this is fairly obvious what the problem here is. So, One heck of a reverberant space and almost unintelligible, if you've not heard the thing before. What we can do, though, is to improve that by changing the speaker, for example. So, 
Exactly the same space, we've just changed the loudspeaker to a much more directional one, so we've not excited the reverberation so much, and, and the intelligibility goes up dramatically because of that. So although you can't change the space necessarily, anything like that, you can't acoustically treat it, you can choose the right tool to do the job and make it hopefully more intelligible. I mean, I hope everybody thought that was more intelligible on the, the second one. Good. It should have been, because all the theory says it was. Um, and in practice, it, it probably was as well. Um, and then if you hear it dry... Sound. It's not just the air vibrating. Sound means feelings. No reverb at all, you can, you can tell. So again, you need to start off with something that is pretty good to start with. Um, yeah, all right. Let's have a look at some delays. One of the problems you can get is either a reflection or a speaker out of sync. It's not being delayed properly. It's a pretty common problem that we come across. So I'll play you some demos of that. And depending on what time the reflection is, the level it is and where it comes from, all those three will play a part as to how you hear it. But if you listen to, say, this... At the period when these events took place, I have just returned from a scientific research in the discipline. Obviously, something really weird going on with the voice, sort of darky <coughs> type thing. That's just got a delay or a reflection coming in at five milliseconds that's pretty strong. And by putting speakers close to walls, off walls, you can get very similar effects uh, to that. Not as quite as strong as that, uh, because the phase won't be quite as strong um, and clean, but it gives you an idea. But it's a very drain pipe type sound. Okay, so that's all it is. It's just purely reflection coming in. And it does all sorts of the weird things to frequency response. You've got classic comb filtering basically going on. But if you change that delay or that reflection. <laughs> I have just returned from a scientific research in the disagreeable territory of Nebraska. OK. Still, something clearly not right, but a very different sound. That's got 20 milliseconds of delay in there. And it starts to clean up a bit. And if you go a bit, a bit longer still, it starts to clean up rather well. At the period when these events took place, I have just returned from a scientific research in the disagreeable territory of Nebraska. <laughs> now, would you say that had a problem? Was it recorded in a live room or what? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing it from the back here, so I don't know. I mean, any ideas as to if that was acceptable or not? If you'd heard that in a room? Well, it's kind of getting there. It starts to sound a bit reverberant. It's got a 50 millisecond delay on it. Um, much more than that, you start to get some echo problems. There's no absolute time when you suddenly say, right, well, that's an echo, that isn't. It depends on the level, direction it comes from, and the frequency response. But I think this one is pretty obvious. Uh, what's going on? <laughs> okay, you've got 150 milliseconds of delay there, so it's 150 feet away, effectively. And then, but you could still actually follow it. You know, it's very annoying, but you could still follow what was being said. This one defies... So what I've done now, I've delayed it by a typical speaking rate. So in fact, the next word completely overlaps on the, on the other one. So that was designed specifically to overlap each word. And again, it's only 250 milliseconds or so, but it gives you that sort of thing. Um, and just so you know what you should have been listening to. At the period when these events took place, I had just returned from a scientific research in the disagreement. I should have asked, actually, if there was any delay in that one, but, but hopefully not. Again, by knowing what it is to start with and what it should sound like, you get an idea. And we'll just finish it off with some pink noise doing the same sort of thing. Any ideas? Did it sound right? Did it sound like pink? No? 
All right, again, you've got a reflection of one millisecond. So that's a speaker next to a wall. Um, yeah, you can't avoid it. And you can get that sort of effect. This one is even more. <laughs> obvious. I mean, I've, I've exaggerated the effect slightly, but they're absolutely what happens. And that's a classic of a speaker, you know, on a side wall going out that way. Yes, you can ameliorate it by putting some absorption on the wall or by making it a more directional speaker, but at you know, 250 hertz and, and even 500 hertz, the speaker's still going to be pretty omnidirectional. So it just goes up in frequency, and you can start to tell where you go. And that sounds pretty rough on, on the voice. Uh, this is an interesting one. And these are, you know, studio recording effects. So I just hit the wrong button, never mind, we're almost at the end anyway. Um. At the period when these events took place, I had just returned from a scientific research in the disagreeable. Was unacceptable. Would you accept speech sounding like that? No? Good, okay. Theory says that you should. But then people that write the books don't actually often know what they're talking about in the real world. Um, interesting. But did it, there are two things here, though. Listen to it again. Does it actually affect the intelligibility? Could you actually follow every word and every sound, or is it just annoying? ...territory of Nebraska in the United States. In virtue of my office as assistant professor in the Museum of Natural History in Paris, the French government had attached me to that expedition. After six months... Okay, so you could still... I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth, but I'm, I'm assuming that you could follow every word without any problem. It's just slightly annoying. And that's one of the problems we've got between intelligibility and sound quality. The two are very different. You know, I can make things sound re really bright like that, but it's still intelligible. Um, but you don't want to listen to it. It's fatiguing. And that's some of the difference we're getting. And, and also, when you're looking at high-quality systems, like in theatres, uh, etc., people say they don't like the sound quality. That often is the case in reverberant spaces, because that's intelligibility. But in, in spaces like this, it's actually the sound quality that people are moaning about. And it may be very fatiguing. I mean, if you're sitting in something like a court uh, room or a you know, listen to Shakespeare for two hours through a system like that is incredibly fatiguing on the ear to do it, but we're talking sound quality, although the intelligibility might be high. I, mean, I got dragged out to look at a problem a while ago, and we're measuring 0.66, which is in, on, on a SDI scale, which basically means there's actually no problem. You can get every single word, and it sounded all right, but the, the local people didn't like it. And it was something about the sound quality, something about the frequency balance they just didn't like. It may have had to do with the, where the direction of the sound came from. And so, although we're now improving sound systems, these other factors are starting to come in and things that we need to con consider um, as to how it goes. I mean, for example, you know, from, do you want an overhead system? Do you want the angle that you actually use the speaker on? It affects what you hear big time. I did a system when distributed in a room like, no, not a room like this, bigger than this, Sitting speakers, because the room could get moved in anything, perfectly intelligible, very nice sound quality. I was very pleased. Guy comes in, didn't like it. He wanted it to come from this height in that direction. That's what, and therefore, as far as he was concerned, it was a disaster. But no measure could you actually show that this, this room was a disaster. It was absolutely fine. It sounded great. It becomes one of perception. And I think that's where we're starting to head uh, in time. Right, I'm rapidly running out of time. We've got about three or four minutes left. Is there any questions, burning things, rubbish? Nobody's thrown anything, which is great. Um, if not... Face cancellation. Yes. Um, I was at a solo guitar uh, concert, and Chuck was getting dropouts. In fact, this is what I was in. Are we talking radio, my on a, or... Oh, right, just out of phase. Yeah. So, depending on the note, you actually got a phase cancellation. Yeah. yeah. That's brilliant. Right, that's true. 
I was going to try and do a demo of that, and I did it so well that nothing came out of the speaker when I played it back. <laughs> I was really mortified. <laughs> I was really quite shocked. I thought I'd get something coming out of it. So um, next time I do this, I'll have to kind of um, not do it quite so well. I was really quite impressed at how, if you really do go out of phase with stuff, um, how, how good the cancellation can be. But yeah, with phase, I mean, you can get massive notches in, in terms of phase cancellation. I mean, be it a reflection or, you know, those signals in a phase. 40 dB notches, no problem at all. Uh, whereas you only get about 6 dB peak if you get them in phase. But uh, no, ma you can get massive notches when, when, you, when you do that. And that's really what you're hearing with the comb filtering when you're actually playing reflection with pink noise. Um, you've got a series of notches. You're not hearing that, you're hearing the overall envelope. And that's what makes it sound sort of grainy uh, and sort of dalek or whatever. I mean, but again, you measure that, that's not how the ear hears it. And the other thing is we've yet to in invent an analyzer that actually mim mimics what we hear. Yeah, we can measure frequency response. We can measure it in all sorts of different ways with different resolutions. We can gate it. We can look at the different time aspects. We still don't know what to do with it all. Um, I mean, the number of people who've got smart, TEF, WinMLS, et cetera, we can play around. We can get completely different responses on the screen. I don't know what it, what it really means and what it, how it relates to what we really hear. I mean, you, you muck about with it until it sort of looks, well, I think that looks like what I'm hearing. It's not really very, very good science, but it's very helpful to do it. I looked at a problem the other day. It was obvious what the problem was listening to it, but trying to get a measure to actually write a report to show people what the problem was, was, was a major issue. Um, I've done it, but I had to change the scales and muck about a little bit, so now I've got this big notch and it, that's, that's your problem, guys. And they, they'll believe me. But I, and I actually... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but I actually had a job to find something I could put in the technical report to say what you needed to justify why they were going to have to spend another 10,000 quid on some extra speakers and changing stuff and whatever. Although they all agreed that, you know, it, it was no good. 